Whelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory have been serving Quad City families and veterans since 1889. Whelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds, and are proud supporters of WQPT. Alternatives is a proud supporter of WQPT and has been serving our community for 40 years. Alternatives provides professional guidance to maintain independence and quality of life for older adults and adults with disabilities. Should we worry about monkeypox and highlighting art treasures from Western Africa in the cities? Schools are about to go back into session with students required to be immunized and COVID vaccinations are either required or highly recommended. It also is a time when the monkeypox virus is spreading in larger cities and still seems like far away problems for most of us. We talked with Janet Hill of the Rock Island County Health Department about these issues and other public health concerns that do have an impact for all of us. It's the start of a new school year and Janet, that always means vaccinations. Um, what do kids need in order to get to, to the start of the school year? And I know every district's a little different, but there's standards across the state. There are. So most children get the vaccinations that they need for school during the infant and toddler years. Uh, but there are some important vaccines that they need before kindergarten, sixth grade, and 12th grade. Well, tell me about the 12th grade uh, vaccinations, because uh, they, they really can be life changing. I mean, they can really save children's lives. That's right. That's the meningococcal vaccine, uh, and meningitis is a very dangerous and often deadly disease that it transmits uh, with people living in close quarters, so such as a college dorm room. That's exactly what I was going to go to, is that, I mean, sometimes we always hear those tragic stories of somebody who has, has uh, acquired that inside a dorm room or a close college setting. Um, is there any hesitancy that you see? right now in regards to some of these vaccinations? You know, we are seeing a growing and completely unnecessary and unfortunate hesitancy. It's being driven by false and discredited information online, and parents really should be afraid of the diseases and not the vaccines. These are uh, tried and true, much tested and very safe and effective vaccines. Well, I kind of sit there and look also at, and you know this case too, is, is that a, a person had acquired polio in New York State and the person was unvaccinated. I mean, is that your real concern, mm -hmm. is that some of, these, uh, some of these diseases, some of these maladies that we thought were in our rearview mirror and put to rest are going to start popping up again? Absolutely. Immunizations are one of public health's greatest victories. And the idea of going backwards is really frustrating and it's completely unnecessary. Let's talk about monkeypox. Uh, there's about 300 cases in Illinois. The number is increased kind of rapidly. Um, the thing of it is, is that people are probably sitting there going, oh God, I mean, it's been COVID, then it's variants of COVID, now it's this. Um, are, are you worried that the public's pretty just weary of any alerts or any warnings there are towards uh, something like monkeypox? No, I think that uh, we are well aware in public health that uh, the public is, is weary. Uh, I would say that most people do not have to worry about monkeypox. It is not contagious in the same way as COVID is. It is skin to skin contact. And, and very close skin to skin contact. So it is transmitting right now in the men who have sex with men population. And so most people, if they practice safer sex and limit the number of partners that they have, have absolutely nothing to worry about. Have we seen any cases in Western Illinois? We have about 350 across the state. Most of them are in the Chicago area. However, there are some um, throughout the entire state. And, uh, you know, we're working hard to make sure that people in the currently affected population uh, 
you know, have the tools and resources they need to avoid be, be getting sick. But it's really important to note that right now it's circulating in the men who have sex to, with men population, but that's not where it's, it's going to stay. Anyone can get monkeypox if they have a close skin to skin contact with someone. Is anybody uh, immune from it? I mean, I know some people that say, oh, I, I got vaccinated for chicken pox, so I should be fine. Uh, tell me about that as far as, and, and even about testing, is that are, are, are there people that are already, you know, protected from it? There, there are vaccines for this. Right now it is being sent out to people who have high risk of the disease. Uh, and people who are close contacts with someone who is a known case. Most infections last about two to four weeks and resolve without specific treatment. However, um, it is a miserable condition until someone gets better. How do you mean it's a miserable condition? It, these poxes are very painful and right now they are showing up in the genital area, which is already sensitive. So. Uh, and it, like I said, it, most of them are, you know, last about two to four weeks. Um, but, you know, just generally touching the pox and uh, getting tested is extremely painful. Let's talk about COVID because that's still so big into everyone's minds right now, but less so. Uh, as you know, after July 4th, you always kind of see some kind of a growth in the numbers of cases or some kind of a spike. 2022 mm -hmm seems to have been much milder than 2021 and definitely 2020. That's right. I mean, we are seeing growing cases. Much of the country is in medium or high community levels, um, but we are in a different place than we were last year and especially the year before that because of vaccination, immunity from previous infections and a really effective post-infection treatments. You're talking about vaccinations, of course, and we're, once again, we get back to the hesitancy um, it was interesting to see that as far as the very young, fewer than 6% of Illinois children under the age of five have received a COVID vaccine. Is that troubling or is that kind of what you were expecting? It is kind of what we were expecting. Uh, I also don't know for sure whether it's based upon hesitancy. Uh, parents are coming to our clinics are quite happy about getting their kids vaccinated. But because these kids need extra care and attention, um, most places, including public health, are asking people to make appointments, which automatically limits the number of people that we can see. Uh, mass vaccination clinics are not efficient or prudent when you're talking about young children. Let's talk about this fall um, with the uh, discussion of perhaps another uh, booster shot to uh, handle more specific other variants of COVID-19. Are you preparing for a, 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 an influx, I guess, of people that may be thinking, okay, I'm going to get a flu shot this fall. I'll get a booster as well. We are prepared to do whatever the FDA and CDC recommend that we do. Uh, the last couple of years, we've had a really strong flu vaccine push because we don't want to have that double barreled uh, spike in healthcare resources because of unvaccinated COVID people and people who are have contracted flu. So it's important to get uh, both of those vaccines and you can get them at the same time. I also want to talk about another uh, health concern that's uh, the spread of fentanyl. Um, and, and we're seeing that it can be very uh, dangerous uh, to the young population in particular, but actually to anybody, a, a huge opioid issue that is continuing to plague society. Have you seen much of a problem in Rock Island County uh, the use or actually the accidental use of fentanyl? So opioid overdoses are increasing in Rock Island County, just like they all across the country. Just to give you some context, the risk of overdose is 18 times higher in 2020 than it was in 2013. And a lot of that is because of fentanyl, which is a synthetic opioid that is highly lethal and sometimes is cut into heroin because it's cheaper for drug, drug dealers to make. How do you combat the problem? I mean, we know what the problem is, I guess, but it seems like combating it is very difficult. Well, I, I had a conversation with a law enforcement official about this, and he said that um, heroin is a problem here. He urges people to, you know, to to test the drugs if they're going to use it, or if 
if or not to use it at all. We had about 10 fatal overdoses in 2020, but there were 41 non-fatal overdoses. And much of the non-fatal overdoses, those people were saved because of a anti or a a uh, naloxone, which actually reverses suspected overdoses. You might know that as Narcan. Yeah, and we've heard of that, and, and the availability is is so critically important that I believe some first responders now have that uh, as, as part of their tools to help save so many lives. But when we're talking about opioids and, and fentanyl in particular, we were really worried about the overuse, too, of, of narcotics and the overprescription of that. Are we seeing a change, at least uh, in, in the physician's community? And I know some patients saying, I don't even want to try to get hooked on it. I don't want to go anywhere near opioids. I think that's absolutely true. The state has started a program called the Opiate Alternative Program. So people who need pain relief, you know, because of short-term situations such as surgery um, can be prescribed medical cannabis. And it's been shown to be highly effective in managing short-term pain. So that is perhaps an alternative that more people should use? That's right. They should talk to their physician about the opioid alternative program um, from the state of Illinois Department of Public Health. Janet Hill from the Rock Island County Health Department. We hope that you are, of course, making the most of these last days of the summer season before fall sets in. Laura Adams has more great ideas that let you enjoy every moment as you go out and about. This is out and about for August 12th through 18th. Watch majestic balloons take off at Rhythm City Casino August 12th and 13th at the Quad Cities Balloon Festival. And be sure to catch the annual Tug Fest, Tug of War across the Mississippi with a carnival and fireworks display on Friday. Music, film, comedy, art, it's all at Alternating Currents August 18th through 21st at over 20 menus in area downtowns. Bring your pups to Riverside Family Aquatic Center in Moline for a doggy dunk on the 14th or pay what you want at the Quad City Botanical Center through the 13th. The International Softball Congress World Fastball Tournament takes place at Green Valley Park in Moline through the 20th, while the Bend Expo Center hosts AACA Central National Car Show on the 13th. Muscadine Bloodline perform at the Rust Belt August 18th. The Songbird Concert Series featuring David G. Smith at the Carl Sandburg Historic Site is on the 14th. There's live music in Clinton on the 14th with Jackie Miller at Wide River Winery. And RME's Live at Five features Sauce Brass Band on the 12th and Diplomats of Solid Sound on the 19th. On stage, the musical disaster continues at Circa 21. And there's still time to catch Quad City Music Guild's Jekyll and Hyde through the 13th. And the Black Box Theater presents the area premiere of the musical Ride the Cyclone through the 20th. For more information, visit wqpt.org. Thank you, Laura. Jason Carl is the frontman of the Quad City group Jason Carl and the whole damn band. The group says it's influenced by rock, folk, and blues musicians, and their original material, they say, written and performed with honesty and passion. That's what Jason brought to the stage when he joined us at the Black Box Theater. Here's Jason Carl with Crazy Life. Thinking you should and knowing you could Time to just write and you're feeling pretty good But you're wondering if it would be alright With nothing to hide, it's easy to decide Just move on and have a look inside But you're wondering why your mind is so uptight Long as 
as things improve, you're doing fine. Keep moving ahead, making some bread, saving up a little like your old. Jason Carl with Crazy Life performed at Moline's Black Box Theater. The Putnam Museum has just opened a new exhibit thanks to the collection of a Quad City family who experienced life in West Africa during the 1950s and 60s. It's part of the Putnam's World Culture Gallery. And the Putnam's Nora Moriarty joined us to talk about Akwaba, West African cultures. So what does Akwaba, what does Akwaba actually mean? Well, Akwaba is a word from the Akan language, uh, the Twi dialect, or excuse me, Twi dialect, and it means welcome. It's the type of thing someone would say to you if they were welcoming you into their own home. So tell me about this exhibit. I mean, it, it's been in storage, so to speak. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing that it's in the Quad Cities in the first place. Yeah, so this is basically an exhibit of West African cultures mm -hmm. represented through this collection of artifacts. We've got about a dozen different cultures represented. And these artifacts, this collection came to us back in the 70s. Uh, the people who donated this to us, their names are Richard and Ann Koslerich. And they're absolutely fantastic. They spent time working and living all over the world. And in, early, uh, in the early part of Richard's career, he was working at an embassy in Togo, which is a small country in West Africa. Exactly. And uh, he was working there, and while he was there, his wife Anne was working in a shop in the city where they bought uh, artifacts and art items, cultural items, and sold them in the shop. And this is all like during the 1950s and the 1960s, right? Yeah, so you're in about the 1960s mm -hmm. at this point. And so Anne was learning a lot, uh, as they told us, you know, they were just starting out their lives as professionals. Sure. And she was learning how to find the marketplace and how to negotiate with the tradeswomen in the Togolese marketplace. Uh, so it was a great adventure for her, and she acquired all these amazing artifacts. And these, uh, you know, Richard and Anne are both Quad citizens, and they decided to send this collection home to the Quad Cities and share it with our community. That's pretty amazing. And, and also, I mean, when you put together an exhibition, uh, these exhibits need a little bit of perspective. You have, mm -hmm. uh, you have somebody on, on your board that's helping you in this area. So we worked with a woman. She's absolutely fantastic. She serves as vice president on the board for the Quad Cities Alliance of Immigrants and Refugees. Her name is Nana Oro Ogoro. 
And she actually was born and grew up in Togo. She's Togolese. So this is absolutely perfect. Yeah, she was wonderful. Uh, she and her family moved here in 2008. She's settled into the Quad Cities, and she's actually helping other immigrants and refugees. And she has her finger on the pulse mm. of these different cultures and what it's like to you know, come into America from West Africa. And she helped with the concept of the exhibit, you know, organizing the ideas of the exhibit. And she actually was the one who came up with the name Aquaba because she wanted people to feel welcome to learn about these cultures. And, and what would you learn? I mean, when, when you see there, you're going to see artifacts, you're going to see items in the exhibit. Mm -hmm. But you're also going to learn a little bit about a culture, language, and the background. Yes, that's right. So a lot of these cultures are represented either by people of a common language or a common ancestry, common history. And you're going to learn about each culture individually and then how they also relate to some of the other cultures. So you're gonna, as you're going around, see different, you know, you might see similarities between the cultures. You might see that these two seem very related and mm -hmm. you look and, oh, okay, they, you know, were from the same kind of geographic area. Or you might see that, oh, well, this culture interacted with this other culture, so maybe that's why their artifacts are so similar. And not only that, we also have some loaned items from uh, the local Togolese dance group, which Nana is a part of. And they actually provided us with a whole other culture, uh, the Temburma culture from Togo. And they have loaned us some very wonderful, colorful uh, dancing objects, things that are either worn or held during dances. So this is actually, you know, it'd be fantastic for adults to see it, but I would assume exposing young people to other cultures is critically important. And I know that's mm -hmm. part of the Putnam's mission. Absolutely. So we always want to make sure that we're trying as much as possible to appeal to, you know, the parents and the grandparents as well as the little <laughs> ones. And, you know, I do agree. It's very important for children to learn about other cultures. And I would hope that as people are looking through this exhibit and seeing these artifacts that embody these cultures and these belief systems, they're not only seeing the differences and they're seeing how diverse these cultures are in West Africa, but they're also seeing the similarities to themselves. You know, there's values represented there that I think most Quad citizens could identify with. You know, honoring your family, being active in your community, and maintaining traditions. Well, and the Putnam has really, over the last two, three years, really been trying to uh, uh, emphasize the Quad City link to so many different types of societies around the mm -hmm. world or, or different technologies. I mean, that's, that's really important for the Putnam to point out these Quad City links. Absolutely, and that's a big part of this new gallery that it's actually in, the World Cultures Gallery. Uh, so the focus of this was not only to bring out parts of our collection that haven't been out in a long time, these cultural items from all over the world, but also to work with people in the Quad Cities who come with this culture or you know identify with this culture, have experience with this culture, and we also want to make sure that we're always working with these people because we want to acknowledge that they are the experts of their own community. You know, there's only so far we can go with academics to actually be able to work with someone who lived in that country, who lived in that culture, and can guide us in the best way to represent that culture. That's incredibly important. In well, it also it. breathes life into the exhibit itself. I mean, Absolutely. as you said, people have experienced it. Do you see that there's a certain pride as well? Is that this is from West Africa, mm -hmm. this is important to my culture, I really want you to come see it. Absolutely. When I was working with Nana on the concept of this, she was telling me when you know we were talking about how eager she was to learn about other people's cultures, she was also eager to share her own cultures with us. And this excitement, and like you said, pride, in it being able to use this collection that we have at the Putnam and be able to really, you know, bring people in, see these objects, see the proof right in front of you about this culture, and just be able to to share it at the most human level. Yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit about what's going on coming up this fall in the Putnam, because you've had a very successful summer. You've had a lot of kids camps that are going mm -hmm. on. Um, you have rotating exhibits. You have permanent exhibits as well. What's coming up in the fall? Well, we are continuing the program that we partnered with American Chemical Society on, where we do free, uh, with general admission, uh, chemistry demonstrations. So we're working with ACS, American Chemical Society, on that. And if you pay attention to the calendar, you can come on a day where there's an actual real-life chemistry professor doing the demonstration with you. And, and like you said, I mean, just active involvement, participation, mm -hmm. that's a big deal now. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, 
we're still working on our local history update at the moment for our local exhibit. We announced that last year. And that is very much all about community involvement. We work with local partners, local representatives of underrepresented communities to make sure that they're being depicted in our exhibits in a respectful and accurate way and to make sure that they are included in our combined history as Quad Citizens. Because, let's be honest, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a mixture of cultures and mm -hmm. backgrounds, and you want to make sure that everyone is represented mm -hmm. that has, what, touched the lives of people in the Quad Cities. Absolutely, and contributed very actively to our history and our development. Nora Moriarty with the Putna Museum. The exhibit, Akwaba, West African Cultures, is made possible thanks to the sponsorship of the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs and the Scott County Regional Authority. On the air, on the radio, on the web, on your mobile device, and streaming on your computer, thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory have been serving Quad City families and veterans since 1889. Wheeland Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds, and are proud supporters of WQPT. Alternatives is a proud supporter of WQPT and has been serving our community for 40 years. Alternatives provides professional guidance to maintain independence and quality of life for older adults and adults with disabilities.